Oh, Father, thank you so much for inviting us, asking us to come, come uh, as your body of Christ uh, to worship you, Lord. It just brings us into such a place where we no longer have our eyes so fixed on this kingdom, but we go high, Lord. We go high into your kingdom, and we know that we believe, we believe these truths that we've just sang because you've given us the faith to believe God. You've given us your son, Jesus. You've given us it all. And Lord, we just so humbly come and say thank you. Thank you that you would invite us to come and we open our minds and our hearts to worship you, to prepare our hearts for the message to go back into the ancient word, into Exodus, and look at these commandments in ways that focus us on, Lord God, the kingdom come, the kingdom that lives in our heart. And so we just thank you. We thank you for every person who's come before us this Sunday again to prepare such a tabernacle for us to come to worship a sanctuary Lord God and we can come um, in confidence because of what your son Jesus has done for us Lord we're just in awe and so we open our hearts we open our mind we open our ears to hear uh, what this verse means Lord uh, not in this kingdom as much as your kingdom so thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of your word and that you have become word and you dwell in us. It's in your sweet name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So our verse, our commandment is Exodus twenty thirteen, And it's commandment six, as pastor remind us today, you shall not murder. Thank you. I'm with my microphone on? Goodness. I think I said last week, uh, don't get too used to all of these short scripture readings. Uh, they will get longer once we finish the, the commandments. So enjoy the, the short passages while we have them and then get ready for longer ones to come as we move forward in Exodus. Let me uh, go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this morning. Father, your word says this, that we've heard it said to those of old that you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at an altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First go be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Lord, we come to this text that is going to push against the desires of our heart, that is going to demand more of us than what we want to give. And we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us to hear the words of the text this morning and to respond in obedience. Lord, help us to find our Rest in Christ, Lord. Help him to be our source of salvation this morning, the one we put our trust in and not our own good deeds. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 83. 83, that's the number of homicides in Albuquerque as of September 21st, 2021. Through nine months of the year, that's already seven more homicides than in 2020. As alarming as those numbers are, that doesn't even put Albuquerque in the top 20 cities for the highest murder rates per, per 100,000 citizens. In fact, Albuquerque sits in the 40 first spot on that list. Compare this with some of the rates of murder that were described in the era right before the life of Jesus that we still have record of from the Sanhedrin of the day. 
who described it as a rare occurrence to have to try a case like this once every seven years for breaking this commandment. What a difference from 2,000 years ago. But my guess is most of us are not really surprised by those numbers for Albuquerque. In fact, we've probably lived with these kind of numbers and this kind of knowledge for as long as you have been in the city. In fact, I recall uh, when I was interviewing to come to Center City Church, I had a list of questions that I had for the elders, and one of them was, is it a safe city? (laughs) To which I never really got a reply before we moved out here. (laughs) If you've lived in Albuquerque for any length of time, you know that safety is a large concern of the citizens in our city and comes up every election cycle as a major political point. But by and large, my guess is we think of this as somebody else's commandment that they have disobeyed. You may have even been looking forward to this commandment because you might say, well, those first five commandments were pretty rough on me, pastor. I felt guilty and convicted for five weeks in a row. I realized that I broke every single one of them, and now I'm looking forward to a commandment that I think I'll be able to sit through guilt-free. Well, I think by the time we get to the end of the sermon today, I hope we all realize that we are far more guilty of breaking this commandment than we would be comfortable admitting to one another. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, if they're not already opened up there. Exodus is going to be the second book in your Bible. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. We are going through the Ten Commandments, and we've been looking at them one by one, but it would be good for us here to just take a minute to review kind of two important principles in going through the Ten Commandments that we went over at the beginning and we've periodically refreshed on. The first is this. Our obedience of these commandments does not earn us God's favor but it flows from God's favor that has been given to us. Remember that God first redeemed Israel from slavery in Egypt. He first gave them the identity of being his firstborn son. He brought them into the wilderness, meets with them at Sinai to reveal how to live in relationship with God and others. These commandments are how redeemed people live in relationship to the God who delivered them. They do not deliver you into relationship with God. Number two, the commandments have two halves to them. The first half focuses on our relationship with God. The second half instructs us on how we live in relationship with others. Last week, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, is the bridge to these two sections. Jesus even speaks of these two sections when he sums up the Ten Commandments and sums up the law by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He's summing up the two halves of the law that the first half is about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second half is about loving your neighbor as yourself. And so as we get into this second half of commandments, we're going to notice that they're all about relationships. They're all about how we interact with one another. They're also a lot shorter Four words in our English Bible. If you have a Hebrew Bible with you this morning, you'll notice it's only two words that are in the text and in the command. The commandment prohibits murder, but to 
say it in the positive version, we might sum it up like this. That we are to value and protect life because God is the giver of life. That we are to value and protect life because God is the giver of life. So to unfold this, what I want to do is look at first what the commandment prohibits. Number two, why the commandment prohibits it. And number three, how Jesus shows us that we're all guilty of breaking it. Okay, so what the commandment prohibits, why the commandment prohibits it, and how Jesus shows us that we're all guilty of breaking it. Right off the bat, under what the commandment prohibits, we have an issue that we need to resolve. I grew up using the old King James Version of the Bible. If you have a King James Version of the Bible with you this morning, your commandment will read a little bit different than the one that Pam read for us. In fact, it was, it, it's kind of shaped our understanding of this commandment, maybe in some unhelpful ways. If you have a King James, it says, Thou shalt not kill. The problem is, why is there a T at the end of shall? No, I'm just kidding. That's not the problem. The problem is, why does it say kill and not murder? There are a couple words in Hebrew that get at the idea of killing. It's important that we kind of dissect the word that is used here to differentiate what is actually being prohibited. Right? The, the command to not kill might lead us to places that are a little bit different than thou shalt not murder. If it's thou shalt not kill, we might end up as pacifists in our church, right? Because that would seem to prohibit any killing of any kind. The word that is used here is a particularly narrow word that is used for the unlawful taking of life. The word ratzak in Hebrew, it's used very particularly for the unlawful taking of life. So for instance, this word is never used in the Bible to describe self-defense. This word is never used in the Bible to describe killing in war. This word is never used in the Bible to describe capital punishment. Right? If you want to make cases for and against either of those topics, you'll have to do so from another text because this word is not prohibiting those things per se. It has a more particular use of an individual or group of individuals who are unlawfully taking the life of another person. Let me give you a couple of examples. It's used in scripture to describe premeditated, intentional murder. For instance, this is the word that's used in 1 Kings 21 to describe the premeditated murder of a man named Naboth who owned a vineyard that King Ahab and Jezebel desired. They plotted and deceived a way that they could kill Naboth and take his vineyard for themselves. This is the word that is used in that particular text. Judges uses this word to describe the murder of a Levite's concubine who was raped and murdered by a crowd of people. This is the word that is used to describe that. Premeditated, planned out, intentional murder of someone else. This word is also used to describe unpremeditated, intentional killing of another individual. In the book of Numbers, we find this word being used to describe someone who kills another individual in a fit of rage, grabbing a piece of wood or using their hands to strike another individual in a way that kills them and ends their life. It's not premeditated, but it is intentional. Finally, it is used in places to describe reckless killing of another individual. In the Pentateuch, there is a system that was devised through cities that were called the cities of refuge. 
These were cities that the Levites would inhabit. There were six cities designated as cities of refuge, and they were evenly spaced throughout the kingdom of Israel. If you recklessly ended the life of another person in such a way that that person's family might want to come and exact revenge against you, you could flee to one of these cities of refuge and you would be safe, you would be preserved from the family that wanted to take your life because you took the life of someone else. So an example of this that is given is two individuals who go into the woods to cut trees down. One man fails to inspect his axe before they begin to cut their trees down. And as he's chopping the tree down, the head of the axe flies off and kills his friend who was with him. This would be an example of reckless Uh, the reckless killing of another individual, the lack of inspection of his tool, not taking care of his tool, and it led to the death of his friend who was with him in the woods. He could flee to a city of refuge if his family came after him to take his life in revenge. This word is used to describe that incident. These might sum up the categories in our culture of murder, and manslaughter and the different varying um, nuances of those particular terms within our legal system. To find a biblical example of someone breaking this command, we might go back to the story of Cain and Abel. If you remember the story of Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel were two brothers. They were the sons of Adam and Eve. And after Adam and Eve left the garden and were there to uh, kind of, they were building their life outside the garden and they had two sons and uh, and, and Abel was a, a shepherd and he tended to flocks and Cain was a, a farmer and, and he had crops and they bring their their offerings to the Lord, and and the book of Hebrews tells us that Abel brought his by faith, and Cain, by implication, did not bring his by faith. And so the Lord accepts the offering of Abel, he rejects the offering of Cain, and the Lord sees Cain, and his face is downcast, is what it says. He's He's droopy in his face and the Lord says, what is wrong? And he says, I don't understand why you accepted my brother's offering and not mine. And so the Lord begins to explain to him and Cain's anger against his brother begins to build and build and build until it says that Cain waited in the field for his brother to come and when he came, he rose and he struck him and killed him. This is premeditated murder. This is what this commandment is prohibiting the taking of the life of another individually, of another individual. So that is what the command prohibits. I think it's good for us now to turn to why does the command prohibit it? Now you might say, well, pastor, that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think you need to give me any particular reason of why I should not break this command. I don't want anybody breaking this command against me. So it seems pretty self-explanatory that I would not break this command against anybody else. Why do we need an explanation? And you might even say, well, pastor, the text doesn't even give us an explanation. So where is this going to come from? Well, we don't get an explanation here, but there is a place in scripture where this command was given originally and there is explanation given. And I think it's going to help open up, help us to see some of the reason of why this command reflects the character of the law giver. If you turn back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Just to give you a little bit of context of where we're coming from, this is uh, after the flood, right? So the flood and Noah and his family on the ark, and the families, uh, his family is there on the ark, and they come out of the ark, and God makes a covenant with Noah. 
All right, we remember the, the rainbow as the sign of the covenant. And in chapter 9, verse 1, we'll find language that is very reminiscent of creation where God blesses Noah and his sons and says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is very much like Genesis chapter 1. And then as we go down, we find a, a, maybe a more unusual commandment in verse 4 that says, you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. So, so it's not a command against eating animals, right? It's, it's not prohibiting somebody from eating animals, but it is prohibiting eating animals without first draining the blood. The idea being that it's eating the, it's taking the life of the animal. There, there's there's a, a, an idea here, I think, of what is being spoken of, that when the life of an animal is to be taken for consumption, that there is to be great respect and care for it because it is a life, that God has created. One author says it like this, that disregard for the gift of life was an affront to the giver of that life. From this idea, we find later in Leviticus, some of these laws reiterated, but the purpose of it and the way it's given is that when life of an animal is taken, it is to be done for purpose and with respect in a way that honors the giver of that life. We don't just kill animals for sport and for fun and for game, right? There is to be respect that is happening there. I learned this, my dad taught me this lesson when, um, when I was younger I grew up at a Christian camp, and one of the things that we liked to go and do was to shoot bows and arrows down at the, the field. And my dad had this uh, old truck. I think it was probably like a 1970 truck. And, you know, uh, we used to do things that, like, you probably should not do, and like seeing how many kids we could pile in the back of the truck and ride down this really bumpy, unmaintained road and, you know, trying to set records of like 20 or 25 kids in the back of a truck. And, and we were riding in the back of a truck one day with all the archery equipment. And, and I remember seeing this, this bunny down in the thicket. And I, and I said, dad, stop the truck, stop the truck. And, uh, he looks back and I'm in the back and I've got, I've got the arrow in the bow and I've got to pull back. And this bunny's probably 20 yards, uh, maybe, maybe 20 feet, uh, you know, somewhere in that range. Uh, I don't remember well out of my range of accuracy though, with the bow and arrow that I have. And I look and I, I was ready to test out my skills and I've got the, the arrow pulled back and I'm ready to go. And my dad says, you know, if you kill it, you got to eat it. Well, I let the tension off the, the bowstring for just a second, and I said, well, wh what do you mean? He said, well, we're not just going to kill an animal to just kill an animal. If you're going to kill it, you're going to skin it, and you're going to cook it, and you're going to eat it. Well, let me just say, my desire to kill that bunny went way down in that moment. Like, I didn't want to go through all of that work to be respectful and, and, and have purpose with it. And, and I learned my lesson, right? This idea that disregard for the gift of life is an affront to the giver of life. That when the life of an animal is taken, it should be done so for purpose and with respect. Now, God takes this instruction about the animal, because this is not really a command about animals, but it's going to help give the foundation for how the same logic is, is applied and amplified to humans. Because what he goes on to say in verse 5 is, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning from every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Do you hear the reason 
that's given for why we are not to take the life of another human being. Because we're made in the image of God. So what applied to the animal is applied and amplified to the human. Because what's distinguished between the two is that humans, unlike animals, are created in the image of God. God gives life to animals in a way that reflects, right, that that shows that he is the giver of life. But to humans, he has not only given life, he has given his image. And that image is to be respected and cared for. So when the illegal killing of another human being happens, it is a front to two of God's characteristics, I think. The first is it transgresses against his sovereignty. Right? It fails to recognize that God is the giver of life. He alone has the authority to give life and take life. It is not our place to usurp his authority by taking life when God has not permitted life to be taken. But it is also an affront against his majesty. If sovereignty refers to God's authority, majesty refers to God's beauty. The beauty that he has instilled in creation. The value that he has put in every human being by creating them in his image. When human life is taken unjustly, it mars the majesty of God. Now, I think if we take this logic and we can apply it into some important issues in our day that we can bring these two concepts to bear. The first is abortion, right? That in valuing and protecting life, God has called us to value and protect life, even the life of the unborn, because life begins at conception, And God is the one who has given that life. Life even in the womb is to be protected and valued because God is the one who has given the gift of that life and has begun to intricately design that child into the image of God. I think this speaks into the issue of euthanasia as well ending the life of someone who is terminally ill. And what seeks to be a way to ease suffering and and show comfort to those who are hurting and in pain, right? But it takes the idea that we have the authority to take the life of another prematurely out of the hands of God. It is not a It is not an authority that God has given us as humans to take the life of another person in that way. As Christians, we should recognize God's sovereignty to give and take life and to protect the beauty that he has instilled in humans by making them in his image. So we see what the command prohibits, why the command prohibits it. But lastly, we need to look at how Jesus shows us we're all guilty of breaking it. You might be feeling pretty good right now at at this point in the sermon. Pastor, I haven't broken these commandments. Try and prove to me that I have. Well, I will. Jesus picks up on this commandment in Matthew chapter chapter 5. Flip over there. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament. It's the first gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus begins on this topic of how does a person enter into the kingdom of God? 
Right? How do you enter into God's kingdom? This is an important question, right? I mean, this is essentially the question of how is a person saved? How does a person enter into God's kingdom? This is the context that Jesus is speaking of and specifically related to the law. Right? Jesus says in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 5, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, right? He said, I didn't come to get rid of the law and the prophets, but instead I came to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And now notice what he goes on to say, verse 19, therefore, okay, because of this, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you have to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisee and the scribe. Okay, maybe we're entering into some gray area now, okay? I'm not quite sure if that's proven anything yet, but, but, but then he goes on to say what he means by this, okay? And this is really important. Verse 21, you have said that it was said to those of old, right? So, so you've heard previously, you've heard in the law, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. You see, we're going all the way back here to the sixth commandment. You have heard it said of old, you shall not murder. You've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it. You've heard it for all your days. You've heard it plenty of times. You know that is the commandment. I think to some degree, we're probably all in that camp, right? We know we've heard that commandment. We know we should keep it. You might even be saying, I think I've kept that commandment. But verse 22 don't you hate it when that's in the scripture sometime? You're feeling really good. And then, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Uh oh. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. This is the part where you probably shouldn't be feeling so good about your obedience to this command because what Jesus says is that you may not have externally murdered anybody, but the sin of murder has a far deeper beginning place in your life. You didn't just come to a place of killing another person. That the sin of murder began in a way that looked very different. We might categorize them like this. That you have broken this commandment if you are holding anger, you are hurling insults, or you are holding contempt. Notice there is a progression to get to the place of murder. This seems to be the progression that Jesus gives in verse 22. If you are angry with your brother. Now you can't say, well, I don't have a brother. Whew. At least I passed this command. No, 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 no. This is anybody else, right? So you can insert any name into here instead of brother, right? If you're holding anger against your brother or your sister or your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad or your child or your grandparent, or your roommate, or your professor, or your boss, or your coworker, or your pastor. Mm -hmm. 
this is the beginning place that leads to murder. This is what we saw with Cain, right? He was angry at God and angry at his brother that God accepted his sacrifice and not his own. This is where it begins. And if you have anger against your brother, right, Jesus is saying, you have broken this commandment. But that's not where murder ends, right? Holding anger, right, then turns to a place of hurling insults against other people. You may hurl those insults inwardly first. You may hurl them in your mind moment after moment, day after day at the person that you have anger against. You may tell them off in your mind throughout the day over and over and over again before it ever comes out. But you're still insulting them. Then you might go to social media and you think, well, that's a little bit safer place. I'm going to start letting it out on Facebook or I'm going to let it out on Instagram and I'm going to give them a piece of my mind through social media. But then eventually you start hurling insults to someone's face because your anger is taking you to a place where you just don't care anymore. And finally, after you've hurled enough insults at someone, you'll hold contempt against that other person. To have contempt towards someone, to look at someone with contempt is to look down on them as less than you. Right? It's to, to look at them as less than you human, less than you, less important than you, less valuable than you, less respected than you. And yet what God says is it's still someone who's made in my image. You see, to get to the place of murder, you have to look down on someone to the place where you no longer see them as human, to where you're willing to take their life. And so Jesus tells us that if we're offering a gift at the altar, if we're coming to worship, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First be reconciled and then come and worship. Some of you are guilty of murder today and have some work of reconciliation that needs to be done, that needs to be initiated, that needs to be pursued, that needs to be finalized. This is what Jesus is calling us to. The problem is, okay, guilty, condemned, but if, if we have to be more righteous than the Pharisees to enter into the kingdom of heaven, how does anyone ever enter into the kingdom of heaven? How does anyone ever get into God's kingdom if we have to be more righteous than the Pharisees and, and yet Jesus has just exposed that our hearts are full of murder against one another? What hope do we have? And yet this is then where we look to Jesus, the one who we hurled our insults against. The one we held our anger against. The one we held in contempt. And eventually the one that we killed on the cross because of our sin. The one we unjustly put on the cross and put to death who did not deserve to be killed. And Jesus calls us not to look at our own righteousness not to look at our own ability to keep these commandments, but to turn and look to Jesus, the one who has kept these commandments in our place and willingly went to the cross where he was killed unjustly so that we could be forgiven. And when we fall short,
come to Jesus, to turn to him and put your faith in him. You will run yourself ragged realizing that you cannot keep these commandments more righteously than the Pharisees. And your only hope is to turn and trust in Jesus. You've never trusted in Jesus. Today is the day to come and put your faith in him. being tender-hearted towards one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. I mean, these are three, three pieces here of, of what you put on in place of anger. And you've got to be active in putting anger to death in your life. Anger will not somehow, some way, just randomly leave your life. It, it doesn't just say... Okay, I've had enough with you. I'm going to go help make somebody else angry. No, if you're not intentional and active about getting rid of anger in your life, you, you won't. And he gives us this progression that almost goes backwards. Where you begin, Christian, is that you go back and you go deeper into Christ's forgiveness of you. And you have to realize the love and forgiveness that God has shown towards you, the undeserved love that has been given to you and the way that God forgave you. And as, as you know that more, as you, as you go deeper into that, I think of your life as a, as a cup, right? And you begin to fill it with water. And the more water that goes into the cup right, is, is your understanding, your, your depth of knowing that Christ has forgiven you. Right? And as that gets fuller and fuller and fuller, eventually it's going to overflow out of the cup. And, and that's what then lets you go and you forgive others who have forgiven you. Anger it, it will, will consume you. And C.S. Lewis says that bitterness is like drinking a vial of poison and expecting the other person to die from it. And so you learn to forgive by pushing deeper into Christ's forgiveness of you. The harsher the offense, the more you need to spend reflecting on Christ's forgiveness of you. But then as you, as you, as you, as you allow this forgiveness to, to well up in you, right, you become a more tender-hearted person. Right? Your, your heart goes from one that is hard and callous to one that is tender towards other people. And as your heart becomes more tender towards other people, mm -hmm. kindness becomes a far more normal response to others. Because your heart isn't guarded and calloused and protected against anybody who might harm it, but it's tender and it's ready to show kindness to others. If the anger is deep enough and the bitter has lasted long enough, you may need help, Christian. You may need a friend. You may need a counselor. You may need a pastor. Someone who can walk through that anger with you to help you reflect on the love of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, the, uh, to learn how to forgive others, to, 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 to learn how to be tender-hearted and to show kindness towards those who have harmed you. Jesus says that anyone can be kind towards someone who is kind to them. 
but a mark of a Christian is someone who can be kind and loving towards an enemy. Because that's the way Jesus loved us. He loved us while we were still sinners. He died for you. I think we all have some murder in our hearts that we need to deal with. We have anger. We have life that we need to value and protect because God is the giver of life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you that we can come and take this commandment, Lord, and you can open our eyes to see the fullness of this command. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us to walk in obedience, Lord. Help us to uh, strengthen us to trust in Christ and to turn to Him. And, and yet, Lord, that we would, as we do that, be strengthened to walk in obedience. Lord, knowing that we will never have more righteousness than a Pharisee and scribe, but we can have the righteousness of Christ by faith. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.